respected dignitaries on the dais, distinguished experts, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Secretary DHR and DGICMR, I welcome you all to this symposium on artificial intelligence for health being organized by Indian Council of Medical Research, National Institute of Communication Finance in collaboration with ITU and WHO. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Rajiv Roy, who's Senior Financial Advisor in the Council of Medical Research to deliver the welcome address. Uh, respected Professor Dr. V.K. Paul, Member Niti Ayog, Sri P.K. Sinha, Member Finance, Digital Communications Commission of India, Dr. G.S. Toteja, Additional DG ICMR, Professor Dr. Thomas Vigant, Chairman of this ITU focus group on AI for Health, Sri Manish Sinha, DG NICF, my colleague Dr. Chandrasekhar, Head AI ICMR, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. I have been given this responsibility, just a small correction. Uh, this is my introductory lecture. The welcome address will be given by uh, Mr. Sinha and uh, our doctor, additional DG Dr. Tuteja. My responsibility is to introduce this August gathering to the concept of this today's symposium. Uh, this symposium, today's symposium is on the subject of application of artificial health in the area of very, very sensitive issue which is related to human health. So this symposium is one day symposium where we are going to touch upon various important aspects of application of AI in the area of health, like fundamentals of AI. There will be sessions where representatives from different countries will be sharing with us the different countries' perspective on the application of AI in the area of health and so on. Our friends, there are three important pillars. If you think about uh, artificial intelligence and health, there are three important pillars of this subject. One is data, another is algorithm, and the third is regulatory and ethical framework. All three pillars are equally important. We have lots of work done in the area of data and in the area of algorithm development, but we have made very little development in the area of developing a regulatory and ethical framework to monitor application of AI in the area of health. Keeping this in view, Today we are going to have two very meaningful panel discussions where eminent panelists will be deliberating upon this delicate issue of regulatory and ethical framework to monitor application of AI in the area of health. I hope that this August gathering will make that panel discussion very meaningful by raising very relevant questions and trying to find out solutions for those relevant questions during the panel discussion. In addition to that, we are having 10 innovators with us who have done their innovations in the area of AI tools for various health related issues. We will be having one full session sharing their experience, their challenges while developing, deploying such AI tool for the health related issues. So I'm sure that this day is going to be very interesting and very informative for all of us. Now, before I call upon my colleague, Dr. Chandrasekhar, to tell this gathering about ICMR, I would like to go on record to express ICMR's gratitude to WHO and ITU for giving us this opportunity to host the seventh focus group meeting here at ICMR. A big thank you. Now I would request Dr. Chandrasekhar to deliver his address, please. Dr. Chandrasekhar, thank you. Good morning.
morning, uh, dignitaries on the dais, the distinguished uh, participants, my colleagues in ICMR, I welcome you to ICMR. It is a great occasion for us to be hosting you for this very important symposium that is on artificial intelligence. ICMR is the oldest R&D organization in the world. We were formed in 1911. We had our centenary in 2011. And we have grown since our inception to a very big organization. We are the premier R&D organization taking care of biomedical research, promoting, coordinating, supporting, and monitoring medical research in the country. We in the ICMR headquarters have seven, eight big divisions by the name of epidemiology, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, basic medical sciences, reproductive health, publications. And in last seven to eight years, we have seen that supporting biomedical research for enhancing scientific knowledge is not enough unless we can take the benefits of this research to the communities and the program and the people of this country and beyond. In 2014, we created a new division of innovations and transition research with the impetus on creating medical innovations, health innovations that could have applications in the field that can be used by the people, that can be used by the programs. The idea was to promote frugal innovations because diagnostics are very, very expensive. Nobody can afford this, neither in our country, beyond, and even in the most developed countries, diagnostics is a challenge and has to be taken care of because the resources always are a limitation. So with that focus, we have created about 20 innovations and I am proud to say on this platform is that 20 innovations that we have carried over a period of time have now been commercialized. They have been taken over by the industry and some of those in, in, uh, uh, products are available on the shelves. We found that Creating this kind of a knowledge base and giving innovations is a very good thing. And we have asked all our intramural institutions and the extramural funding that we are doing is to focus on creating innovations, which could be anything. It could be a product, diagnostics, device, or anything which is a better treatment schedule than before, which can save the cost, the time, so that the compliance can be improved. We have taken a very big initiative in the area of artificial intelligence as a tool which can help creating knowledge for health, health research, which can have bearing on people's health. That is the fundamental objective of ICMR that we are trying to address. This initiative, I am very, very sure, will go a very long way in creating the knowledge, the infrastructure, the capacity, and the tools which can be used. And I thank all of you for being here and supporting the purpose that we are all here. We will be harnessing the low hanging fruits and devise a strategy which is meaningful for all of us in the coming future. That is the, that is the idea. And wish you all the success, anything that we can help as an organization, we would be very, very forthcoming to address these issues. And I thank all of you for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for giving an overview about ICMR and innovation in translation cell. May I now invite uh, Dr. G.S. Tuteja, who's additional director general, Indian Council of Medical Research, for the welcome address. Respected Dr. Vinod Paul, Honorable Member of Niti Ayog, Respected Shri P. K. Sinhaji, Members DCC and DOT, Respected Professor Thomas, Chair of CA 14H, Respected Mr. Manish Sinha, DG and ICF, Respected Dr. Chan Shekhar, head of the division and former additional DG also, and respected Sri Raji Raji, the, the man behind this show. 
distinguished guests from different countries and friends. Welcome and greetings for the day. And what a day we have chosen for this brainstorming. It is 550th birthday of Sri Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And so this conference will always remember for years to come. Artificial intelligence was recognized as a discipline way back in 1956. And since then, we have made tremendous progress in different fields. However, in the area of health sector, you know, we have started working in very recent past. We all know that non-communicable diseases has been increasing. And in developing country, two-third mortality is due to non-communicable diseases. Here, artificial intelligence can play a very important role. We in ICMR have been doing a research project on early detection of breast cancer in Rajasthan. And over 60,000 women have been screened for early detection of breast cancer. And they have also taught about breast self-examination technique, also communicated the symptoms for early detection of breast cancer. There we are using the smartphone to communicate the messages. But the question comes when we develop the technology, you know, it should be affordable by the people working at the grassroots level, or the people from low socioeconomic status. So my request would be to all of you that when you are deliberating during the course of action, the course of the day, you know, so you must focus on the technology which is affordable. And also, we have to see in many countries, many parts of those countries, you still you see we have the issues with electricity and other basic amenities. Our technology should be like that, that it is a small device and not dependent upon electricity or other required things. There are issues which you are are going to discuss whole day the ethical issues there are some malpractices there are also issues with the regulations and therefore you see time has come when we also talk about explainable artificial intelligence now we have started working in this direction explainable artificial intelligence dependable artificial intelligence but i think explanation will be more important because those who are working or those who are using the technology must understand, you know. And that way, you know, we can take care of certain ethical issues. So there are eminent experts here. I'm sure you see during the course of the day, you see they will have deliberation. So once again, uh, thank you all for coming all the way for this conference and wish you good luck. Thank you, sir, for highlighting the importance of artificial intelligence in health, especially in early detection of diseases. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, we are co-hosting this symposium and meeting in collaboration with NICF and Department of Telecommunication. I would like to invite uh, Mr. P.K. Sinha, who is member Digital Communication uh, Commission, to give a, a welcome address on behalf of Department of Telecommunication. Good morning to all of you. A very warm welcome. Respected uh, Dr. V.K. Paul, Member Niti Ayu, Professor Thomas Vainar, Chair Focus Group on Artificial Intelligence for Health, Dr. J.S. Tuteza, Additional Director General, Dr. Chandrasekhar, Manish Rajura, and all the academicians, scientists, innovators, 
officers from various government departments, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you at this symposium on artificial intelligence for health. A special warm welcome to our guests from abroad who have graced the event with their august urgence. As such, it is in such context that the Rig Beth, the almost one of the oldest of scripture, exhorts all of us to assemble, uh, speak together, let our thought agree, common in utterances, common in thought and feelings. My dear friends, science fiction where it is envisaged to see if why every child needs to he comes to, on this earth he knows whatever is available in this planet and then he will have time sufficient time to search for other things and this is what this is the natural urge of human beings to pass whatever we have intelligence to others. I think this very sense sapiens, they have developed something called artificial intelligence. What is intelligence? Intelligence is an attribute that has since time immemorial drawn the line of distinction between man and machine. Artificial intelligence endeavor of man to pass the day into the latter, that is machine. AI is the intelligence shown by a machine, mind inside a machine. And artificial intelligence is a feature and already a part of everyday life. We are aware of the artificial intelligence, Alexa, Amazon, Alexa, we have Apple 3, Microsoft, Cortana, and very recently there is a novel origin of Don Brown, famous of the, the Da Vinci Code. He talks about the Winston Churchill, the artificial assistant who welcomes professors and all the persons and guides the path. I think this is the finest way and finest way to look into what artificial intelligence can do. And as far as the other aspect of it is concerned, I'll just refer one study. This PWC study, it says science is enormous. Some, this is US dollars, 16 trillion by 2030. And you know the growth of is all about the growth in telecommunications. It is all about faster communications. It is all about big data, big data analytics, internet of things. This is what have developed what is now in every field you have artificial intelligence and we are fortunate in India we have around 1.20 billion of telephones and we are having the almost one of the largest data user almost with 9.8 GB per month India has the world highest uses of data per smartphone and I'm just seeing the Nobel laureate Ramana Tagore portrait over here he wrote a book that is called Ghare Bare, that is the home and the world, where he conceptualizes the all information of the world to be in your hand. Now, we see the era of a smartphone. Now, it is not in our hurry, it is in our palm. The whole world is in our palm in terms of a smartphone. And this smartphone is going, going to be most crucial and fundamental part of expansion of artificial intelligence in health. This can provide the foundation for remote health care and when technology-based applications are used in combinations, they can have transformative effects. Another power, this can be, for example, mobile internet could bring the knowledge of a specialist physicians to community health workers using a combination of 
other disruptive technologies like automation of knowledge work, software residing in the cloud digital tools that enable healthcare workers with modest skills to carry out basic protocols and low cost diagnostic devices that work with the smartphones. There are other combinations with internet of things, the mobile internet and the cloud to monitor prescription drugs and follow the counterfeits. It is estimated that this tracking system of counterfeit drugs could be worth as much as $15 billion per year. The surgical robot device market is anticipated to reach $20 billion. The total value of empowering technologies in healthcare could be $25 billion to $65 billion per year in, by the year 2025. Thus, one of the potentially most groundbreaking domains for the application of AI is in health. Artificial intelligence and data science are rapidly developing in healthcare. It is therefore important that countries have developed or are developing a roadmap for the use of artificial intelligence in health. Hence the importance and timeliness of this symposium where different country perspectives are being presented to share knowledge, experiences for deeper learning. Other important areas that are being addressed are on fundamentals of artificial intelligence in health, ethical and regulatory aspects of AI in health, and innovators of in artificial intelligence for health. It is also important to note that the symposium will be followed by actual display of artificial intelligence tools that will showcase the use of artificial intelligence tools in health. All of us are aware that AI is soon to move and work among us in the form of service, transportation, medical and military robots, possibilities are immense. Currently, there is increasing awareness that a responsible approach to artificial intelligence is needed to ensure the safe, beneficial and the fair use of artificial intelligence technology. Developing artificial intelligence responsibly requires the means to elicit and represent human values, translate these values into technical requirements, develop the means to deal with moral dilemmas and values preferences, and to evaluate systems in terms of their contributions in human well-being. And at this juncture, we all remember our saying that Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya. And it means may all be happy, may all be free from illness and diseases, may all see goodness and auspiciousness in everything, may no one suffer and be happy. This could be the ideology, this could be the driving force for artificial intelligence in health. <clears throat> Other, all these will equally apply to the use of AI in health. I'm sure that the deliberations in the sessions on ethical and regulatory aspects of artificial intelligence in health will dwell on these important issues. And Orwellian concerns that have implications for privacy, safety, and security aspects of patient data. UN organizations like ITU and WHO are also cognizant of the importance of use of artificial intelligence in health. And thus at the ITU, Artificial Industry Good Global Summit in 2017, the World Health Organization and ITU partnered to create a focus group on AI for health. The group is creating benchmark systems which can score the accuracy of AI-based health diagnostic. I hope the deliberations in the symposium will feed into the work of focus group, which is having its seventh meeting from 13th to 15th November at the National Institute of Communication Finance here in Delhi. Use of AI simultaneously has also generated a huge debate on the risk it poses. Science fiction is littered with examples of AI running amok at the expense of humanity. There is also a profound fear that it will overtake jobs and disrupt physicians' patient relationship. But I feel more than being a risk to human values, AI brings in itself enormous potential to improve the lives of many and to ensure human rights at all. There is great hope that artificial intelligence may enable better disease surveillance, facilitate early detection, allow for improved diagnosis, uncover novel treatment, and create an era of truly personalized healthcare. It will be basically a collaborative intelligence. There is nothing to fear from the artificial intelligence. I do have hope that ultimately it is going to make good doctors, great doctors. AI is therefore, and anyway, I, I do think machines cannot better and replace common sense. And common sense is what is required. I am reminded of one story in Panchandra about four friends. 
three of them were intelligent, very, very intelligent. One was not that intelligent. So they were passing through a jungle forest. At one place, there was a heap of bones. So one of the friend knew how to join all the bones together. So he did that. And that skeleton was prepared. That was the skeleton of tiger. The second friend was also proficient in putting blood and flesh in that skeleton. So he also did it. And third friend knew how to put life into that skeleton. And all these three intelligent persons, they decided to bring tiger into life. The fourth friend, he was not that intelligent, but he was having common sense. So he just requested all his friends to stop his, their adventure till he climbs the tree. And the result is well known to all. I am confident that the deliberations in the symposium, when we have so much of intellect, uh, spanning different disciplines at one place, will be extremely useful to all the stakeholders, including the regulators and policy makers. I wish the symposium a grand success, and a special thanks to Edison Secretary, Secretary, ICMR and ITU for envisioning this symposium. Thanks and warm welcome. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that uh, welcome address and highlighting the importance of technology and communication in deployment of AI tools. May I now invite Professor Thomas Wigan, who's also the chair of this WHO ITU focus group on artificial intelligence for health to give a brief about uh, this initiative. Thank you, Manjula. Um, don't yet show that slide because I need to uh, say good morning to... Um, uh, don't. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, dear Mr. Todea, dear Mr. Sinha, dear Mr. Roy, dear Mr. Shekhar, Paul, Mr. Sina, uh, thank you for having us. Actually, we have to thank you for uh, uh, giving us Manjula uh, to help us uh, uh, do our work. And to all of you, welcome. Uh, Manjit, you didn't tell me it's Guru Nanak who has his birthday today. So he played it down. He's, he's uh, helping me to get around. I understood now this is a very important day uh, for, for a Sikh. So. Um, anyway, so what I thought to do is I give you an introduction of the focus group is. For that, I would now to basically tell you a story of how it all started. So back in, well, back in 2018, which was just last year, but it feels like much longer ago, um, there was this um, um, meeting of... Uh, uh, a conference that is now has been held the third time and it was then the second time the conference was held it's called AI for good this conference is trying to take the dialogue away from uh, killing robots and and uh, losing jobs to what AI can do as a good thing and uh, we had a session there uh, on AI for health and I remember Samir being there uh, we had 15 projects being presented and um, they all looked good. They've all looked like fine research projects on AI for health, but we realized there's a gap. Because what happens once the Lancet paper is published? What happens afterwards? There needs to be this track where you take your research and bring it to the patient in a safe way. And this is this was the idea to create the focus group. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, we have accumulated uh, a number of logos there. Um, we uh, are, are carried by the ITU and the World Health Organization, and I have to basically announce the first big success of this meeting. We managed uh, to bring together um, the ICMR and the telecommunications uh, uh, department, so they have been uh, working together for the first time so connecting medicine and IT is actually one of the best, one of the first successes of this meeting. Um, we have uh, received support by the Foundation Botnar to bring in people from all around the world 
those of you who have received a travel grant from Botna, are you already here? Can you wave your hand? Okay, so one is already here, two, I see. So we'll have more coming uh, throughout tomorrow as well. Um, well, let me start with the internet. The internet now has a size of 1.9 times 10 to the power of 21 bytes per year. That's such a big number, nobody knows what that number is. However, um, to give you an idea, running the internet, the ICT devices, including their production and the data centers, takes about 11% of all total, of all electricity. And a fun fact, uh, nuclear energy provides 11%. That's just a coincidence. Just, we just found these two numbers to be the same, okay? Now, uh, that is still interesting. There's something happening in terms of booting. Um, this, this is basically create 450 new power reactors. So the nuclear energy is created by 450 power reactors. Now, my, why, I'm, why am, I, am I telling you this? I'm trying to show you something on the next slide. What do we do? Can I? So in the ITU, we have been managed, managing this up. 5% of all bits on the internet. And when it started in 2003, it was just a document of a crappy Dell computer, nothing else. And so if you look at it, um, you can build things that scale this isn't working, so you can maybe go to the next slide. Um, and so you can build things that scale from zero to that, and that's 250 power plants. So you can create a document that is then powered by 250 um, power plants. Now the problem is of this, and the next slide, um, the problem of this is a lot of this is used for cat videos. <laughs> right? Cats doing this, cats doing that. Can we use the power that's used for this for health? So if you go to the next slide. Um, so can we achieve, for instance, well, what's getting through an app repository as one idea? Uh, next. Okay, now it works. Um, and so, that, okay. Oh, now this is working, okay. Now, the question is, what do we need to do in order to make an app repository work for health, right? And um, let me give you an example of, of what we've been doing. So this is an example of a benchmark that we did in diagnostic support for breast cancer and histopathology, where you uh, look at, uh, you want to diagnose diseases. And at some point there's the biopsy that then leads to the therapy decision. And uh, currently, uh, the evaluation of the biopsy is done that way. So somebody is sitting in front of a microscope and making a qualitative assessment. And um, it's based on these histological slides where you have your uh, cell uh, uh, images that are coming through the pathology process. And uh, you would then um, have your uh, picture uh, enlarged here through the microscope and basically uh, you would, uh, here is the case of breast, breast cancer, identify and classify cancer or uh, the immune cells uh, that would be estimated. And uh, there is a WHO guideline for this, how to do this, and uh, uh, it all looks fine. Now, what can be done actually? It can be done automatically. Here's an example for it in the AI assisted histopathology, where you have the original pictures and you have uh, two pictures, uh, one identifying the cancer cells and the other one identifying the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And um, so the pathologists are in danger, somebody mentioned that. Well, um, but we don't have enough pathologists in the, on this planet, so we need to, to support them. But the other question to ask is, are the patients in danger? And um, well, for that we need the benchmarking. Now, 
if you then, this all looks fine now, if you then take a step back and start looking at the problem in more detail, you find out it's actually quite complicated. Um, people that would do this, do this uh, diagnosis actually went through 10 years of training. And I don't think they uh, spent their time not learning anything, they learned a lot. So you have to bring in the medicine uh, expertise into this. And so for um, starting to work on this, we started to create an annotation specification. This annotation specification allows a reproducible annotation of those images so that you give it to this pathologist and to another one and the annotation would statistically look the same. That means all these aspects there need to be uh, considered and it's just a snapshot of the annotation specification. And so you would then at the end, for instance, get people, experts, medicine experts, to annotate those pictures. And uh, uh, they would provide a result and as with almost everything in medicine, there's uncertainty. So there is not, it's not clear, um, or it's, 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 it's not, uh, the annotations that come from different pathologists will not be the same. So we have to find a way to, to also figure out what to do with different diagnoses uh, coming from the experts. And then we basically would be looking at a benchmarking process where you have uh, your own data over which you train your AI, and then you have your public data. Um, uh, you have the public data that you also trained, and then you have data that you shouldn't know about, which are your test data. And uh, for those, uh, we would run the tests. Here is an example. Uh, we did our first example benchmarking on 50 patients, and uh, uh, we had a submission from Singapore, and uh, we found, we identified cancer cells as a true positive of 0 0.91, and a true negative of 0 0.88, which uh, looks as good as the other pathologists. So we found an algorithm that acts like a pathologist for this particular case. Now, um, the group uh, uh, um, AI for Health uh, was, uh, I'm, I am sharing it. Uh, Stephen Ibaraki is uh, helping us with the outreach work in, in particular. Um, Ramesh Krishnamurti is, is uh, uh, vice Chair uh, Naomi Lee is a Vice Chair. Naomi, would you mind standing up so that people remember you? Thank you. Uh, uh, Samir Pujari is a Vice Chair. And uh, Manjula, you know all, is a Vice Chair. And uh, Shan Xu uh, 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 is also a Vice Chair. So then um, if we go on. We are carried by WHO and ITU, and we have made contact to other organizations to create, increase the outreach, bring in people. Um, we are working on benchmarking, and um, the regulatory process was mentioned, and this is kind of what we're going for first. Nevertheless, we are also looking at other aspects, for instance, digital epidemiology. We, uh, this means we have already a virus outbreak uh, prediction model, at this meeting, we have a, a dengue monitoring uh, model. All of these things also need to be understood, how accurate they are, and whether they should be used, because they will lead to important decisions. And uh, also the health delivery system is something that we will be looking at. So looking at the re regulatory considerations, oops, why is that bracket anyway? We have a working group that particularly looks at this, and Naomi is chairing it, and we have a vice chair from the EMA uh, of Europe, FDA, B Farm of Germany, uh, the HPMA of China, and the CDSCO of India. And um, to give an example of where this goes, so we have started putting together documents. We started to look at the AI for health problem in the regulation part. The upper table you see there is how medical devices are being classified. And um, so if you have a device that, is, uh, uh, that just does uh, clinical management information and it's non-serious and it's category one, and if a device uh, 
uh, would be used uh, to treat and diagnose the patients, and it's critical, then it would be category four. Now, in an AI case, you could actually go ahead and consider this to be a case with approval. So it's just an assistance system still, but then you could you know, extend the table to the left and produce additional uh, device categories. So this is one thing that we've been looking into considering. And uh, some people may say this sounds like science fiction, but actually it's not. Uh, these insulin pumps are actually estimating uh, parameters and they basically uh, decide on what's the estimate and where would you put that in there because it's basically making decisions by itself this device and so um, we are now uh, uh, at the meeting here in, in Delhi we started at the World Health Organization in May uh, sorry we started the World Health Organization in September 2018 uh, the conception was in May the formal creation was in July and then we went to the Columbia University in the US and we went to um, Lausanne uh, in, in January. We went to Shanghai in April. Um, to, then we went back to the conference, AI for Good, um, to present our progress after one year. Uh, we went to Zanzibar uh, two months ago and now we are in Delhi and we will be in January in Brasilia. So you see we are traveling around the world to introduce what we are doing to uh, communities in order to bring in as many interested uh, scientists as possible. And um, we have published about uh, the work in the Lancet. Um, you see that the crowd is changing. If I, this is the Lausanne picture. That is the uh, Zanzibar picture and we'll have another one. So. So we want to have this, the crowd is changing uh, as part of uh, what we do. Uh, there's a website where you find all the resources. The best way to find it is if you type AI4H into a search engine, uh, the first hit will be the website and you'll, you'll just get that. Um, we have basically changed the way we operate to an online virtual meeting type of operation. So. If you're sitting here and think to yourself, hmm, this is interesting, I would like to participate, but no way I can travel to Brasilia in January. Well, you don't have to be at the meetings. You can participate online. You have to cope with the time difference with the jet lag, but that's a different thing. But you can participate online, and uh, we have uh, turned everything into an online scheduling uh, system where you would, accept, would, would create a meeting, and then you would have, we have the tools to collaborate and then you would meet and, and hold your meeting. You would share documents so that you don't have to travel. You can uh, do everything uh, on your desk. And the idea is we don't get a clinician to travel for five days anywhere. That's not happening, right? But we can maybe cut out two hours a week uh, from her or his time to participate in an online meeting and edit and document. So when this uh, is starting to actually take shape and starting to really, really uh, work and move things forward. Um, so maybe the last thing to mention is how we are, what's the idea? How we have basically two groups in the focus group. Now one is, um, one group type or two group types. Uh, one group type is the working group and the other group type is the topic group. Um, the working group is, uh, is, the working groups are a set of groups that, uh, that deal with aspects that are cross-cutting over uh, the number of issues that are occurring. So we have an, we are planning to create an ethical working group. We are late on that, an ethical and legal aspects working group. We are planning to to create a working group on um, clinical evaluation. We already have a working group on data quality. We have a working group on data handling. Um, all of these working groups are supposed to create specifications that are then to be implemented, implemented by the topic groups. The topic groups are groups that deal with, with AI for health topics. So they look at uh, the breast cancer case 
um, and and say this is the data how this is how this should be annotated uh, this is the uh, AI solution the benchmark etc so we they will look at a very specific health topic and we try to bring in as many modalities as we can um, and when they implement what's coming from the working group uh, or the working groups learn from what they implement so we have a interaction between the two so we understand on real health topics um, how uh, they are dealing with certain problems we reflect this back into the working groups the working groups develop specifications and they have to consider all the relevant tasks that AI does in health it doesn't only do just um, prediction of a classification value yes or no cancer present or not it can do for instance segmentation it can do uh, prediction. It can do other things that are relevant. It deals with pictures as input. It deals with time series data as input, text as input. So we have all these modalities and cross-cutting in terms of what AI does. And we have to learn from the real medical cases. And at the end of the day, the first set of outputs from this entire group will be best practice documents. So best practice in terms of how do you do, do, you do data annotation, how do you do uh, statistical analysis of your data. We will provide software tools that basically help you to, to run things. So when you actually are collecting data and annotating them, that's an iterative process. You don't know whether you're, it, uh, typically data annotation is done where you go out and just task people to collect data. Then they come back and then you realize, oh boy, we should have done it differently. Well, you shouldn't do it that way. You should actually task people, they go out, they collect data. As data comes in, you start evaluate. Is this the right thing? You start predicting, uh, is this the right uh, approach to collect the data? As you go and adjust as you go so that your data collection process is effective. And um, the topic groups also will first output best practice documents, and they will be the first one documented to have this, uh, um, uh, have implemented the working group best practice documents. And then we'll look into ev ev elevating everything further into standards as we go. Now, um, I want to skip that, and um, well, maybe I should not skip that because that's important. So the the way we thought of how topic groups are created is that there's a community around a certain disease, malaria, for example. And they should be the ones identifying what should be done in this field of malaria. For instance, the uh, simple diagnostic, somebody mentioned smartphone. Uh, we had last time meeting Doctors Without Borders and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the lady presented the future of medicine, which is Petri dish and the smartphone. Uh, and uh, we would basically then specific, solicit, solicit specific AI for Health proposals and we would evaluate them. And I almost forgot the AI for Health development there in the list because we, it's kind of, it almost seems like because everything published report, we do everything in a transparent way and then disseminate so clinical evaluation and then hopefully it gets used once it gets used we have the big advantage that we can collect data from its use in the field when it's used in the field is performing uh, even and in particular if it's adapting itself or their software releases to adapt it and then you can redo the process so we have currently, I think, 16 groups. This is shown 15. We have four more proposed. For instance, uh, uh, dental work, or as I mentioned, dengue, a dengue monitor. Um, then the uh, working groups are looking at ethical, legal considerations, the AI software lifecycle, reference data annotation, training and test data specifications, AI training process specification, AI test, AI test metric, um, like, what do you test the AI for? That's risk important, right? It doesn't kill the patient. That's a good thing to start with. But what, what next, right? Um, it's efficiency, robustness. Can you 
quantify uncertainty? How certain is the algorithm to make this prediction? Or can you um, explain it, what it does? And um, so moving on. And so basically, I'm gonna just flip through those. There's uh, too much detail for now, we'll be, but we have to go into those and you have those slides available um, on the website. And um, uh, so, and basically what we see is the, 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 the possibility for a research and evaluation pipeline on AI for health. So you have the evaluation, you have uh, the coordination of projects, and you could actually have a fast way to an AI solution. And we try to bring in um, everybody on this uh, who wants, who can contribute, and uh, we're looking into building this up. So thank you very much for being here, being interested. I hope we can lure you into this. You know, we you know, should uh, become interested in working with us. Um, tomorrow and the day after, we'll have the focus group meetings and potentially also on Friday morning, um, where we will basically be having a somewhat dry discussion of what needs to be done, but those are the steps that need to be taken to move things forward. And uh, if you have questions, I'll be around, and also our vice chairs uh, will be around, and you can ask them questions, uh, and uh, yeah, see you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that detailed description of um, focus group on AI for Health. Uh, may I now invite uh, Professor V.K. Paul, who's a member of Niti Ayo and our chief guest, to address the gathering. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, respected Dr. G.S. Toteja ji, Shri P.K. Sinha ji, Dr. Thomas Vigand, Shri Manish Sinaji, Dr. Chandrasekhar, Shri Roy, and distinguished uh, academics, uh, scientists, entrepreneurs, innovators, and the ICMR family. Uh, very warm greetings on Gurupur today. It's a very, very auspicious day, truly. And it is a very profound beginning of this scale in an area which is uh, new and vibrant and ever enlarging. So thank you very much for the kind invitation, Dr. Barkov and colleagues uh, for me to be here this morning. Firstly, I think it is evident to all of us that AI is a way of life Waiting. It's already happened. And there is simply no way that we can be complacent. There's simply no way that we cannot rise to the occasion to harness the potential of AI for health and for all the other sectors for human well being and progress of the society. And I would like to first and foremost express the resolve of the government of India that we shall make the best of AI for this country. And that applies to the area of health indeed. And we are also confident that it is the, the, the technology and the technology uptake and technology evolution is at a stage where we will ensure leadership global leadership in this area. So we would like to work together and with uh, our stakeholders outside this building, across the country and beyond, to make sure that India will be and shall be uh, AI power on the globe. Our current status is a mixed picture. When we look at citable documents on artificial intelligence between 2010, 2016, at the very start in a way of AI revolution, we have only a modest report to give. 
China has 64 publications, shall we say. US 40,000, Japan 17,000, UK 15,000, India 14,000. UK 15,000, India 14,000. Not too bad, but it has to be more exciting. This is just to tell the challenge, share the challenge that we have. And the need for us to rise to the occasion in a holistic way, where resources shall not be a problem. And I'll come back to that. We heard it from Synergy as well. Our resolve and our clarity on how to maintain our leadership. Of course, when we come to H index, we can also see our journey becoming more complex and more, more uh, aspirational. The US which tops the H index is for the years 1996-2016, H index of 413 against 195 of China, against 100 of India. So I think to all the stakeholders within, within this room from our country, it is clear that we have to accelerate our progress and our might and our effort and our ingenuity to, to, be, to be in the running. As has already been stated by Dr. Troteja and colleagues, vast possibilities of usage of AI in health. From prevention and wellness, which is the highest priority for India's policy and development paradigm. As you know, we are building and expanding our comprehensive primary health care now through the health and wellness centers at the Honorable Prime Minister's flagship mission of Ayushman Bharat, early detection of diseases, diagnosis, decision making in a very big way. And we have early experiences emanating from this country, treatments, end of care, but also in the area of public health, surveillance, outbreak for forecasting, mapping of illnesses, sky is the limit. And I think we must create a document which states all the potential reach and the, the, the intensity and the landscape of the uses. AI would also help us to do better biomedical and public health research as a tool and that opens up possibilities of its own kind. AI would also help us to training of our health professionals and health workforce in a more, more focused, more sharp way uh, forward. So possibilities are immense. And one other context that must be stated in this international gathering is that we have a huge scope of AI to be to be encompassed for our traditional medicine, namely Ayurveda in particular. Uh, peculiarly, Ayurveda, uh, very individual based uh, traditional medicine. And uh, we have from the, from the other side of the, of the table, we have been wondering how these decisions are made. Perhaps the AI can bridge their science and our science, so to say, and advance it further. So we must remember that there's a huge scope in now trying to build bridges with Ayurveda and unlock the potential that Ayurveda offers for, for health of people. Both at the population level and, and at the individual level, the potential is immense. The point I wish to highlight is that it's not only about individual decision making, toward which may be more AI usage as of now, to make decisions in particular, but I want to highlight the fact that population level, uh, public health, population level health sciences uh, have a huge scope of embracing AI as well. The best things happen when the sciences meet. So genomics and AI, when they will marry, there'll be many, many, many uses, many insights. Epidemiology, marrying AI will give us many more insights Climate data marrying AI would give us more answers of a certain kind in the health sciences. The point I'm making is that we could visualize the many, many dimensions of AI when we look at health as a paradigm. And I want this discourse to actually you know, be in the mainstream in our medical schools, in our research institutions, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and breaking down to general AI, sensory AI, cognitive AI, 
physical AI and so on. So there are very, very many dimensions and uh, terminologies that I, I urge that we, we make it mainstream so that we can have more deep discourse. <laughs> There are five things that I like to bring to your attention as a way forward. Firstly, we will need, as we unfold our endeavors, so we are in ICMR, we are in the apex think, think knowledge hub of our nation for health sciences and medical sciences. So we will need programs. We will need how we work systematically to harness the potential of AI for health in innovation, in new, new solutions for education, for research and patient care and so on and so forth. The things that I mentioned and you heard from all of us. So we will need specific thematic areas on which we work and that needs to be developed. So we need programs, we need, uh, we need ideas which get grouped around programs with sufficient leeway for, 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 for adaptation, for improvement and they should not be very rigid. Secondly, we will surely need interdisciplinary teams. It has to be for us to be competitive and for us to be efficient and for us to be fast. We will surely need interdisciplinary teams and how do we build them? And that should be, you know, from the very beginning, that should be a mainstream action, mainstream approach, mainstream principle that we doctrine for us to follow. Third, we must think of scale. We can accept small studies, we can accept small initiatives. I want thousands of PG theses, for example, to be around AI if possible. Individual endeavors, fine, but I think it's about scale. And the embodiment of AI at the core, I, as I understand, uh, is data. Data is gold. India has potential for the largest data sets in, in many, many areas, if not in almost all the areas of health, so to say. So we must think of scale, sir. I want us to take home uh, you know, this message from our partner ministries as well as uh, Department of Health Research, ICMR, and the fraternity out here. We must think of big, big solutions, big endeavors, and things that can be done at scale so that there is a clear peak that is visible to the world. We will have to create facilities and infrastructure. That's my fourth point. How do we do it? I like us to think about and put down these ideas individually because this is a journey where this kind of a thinking, comprehensive thinking is still shaping up. Your ideas will go far and we look forward to those ideas. And then we will need the fifth thing, namely the connect, the governance, the kind of thing that we're trying to do here and how interdisciplinary connects can be made, how interministerial connects can be made, how we can connect a faculty of a medical college to a resource out there where we can work together. And then we need two other things to make it happen. One, you have rightly positioned the discussion around ethics and regulatory issues. And thank you for doing it because this was waiting to be done. And I see Dr. Muthuswami here, who's been, uh, you know, the, the leader of, uh, of ethics uh, in biomedical research and health uh, of this nation. So thank you for taking that initiative. And we must deliver on this in a systematic way, in a finite way. Version one of our ethics and regulatory approach should be out in a finite period of time. If there is one thing that we begin today and we will see conclusion of this in a finite time, it should be around the ethics and regulatory affairs and that, thank you for doing that initiative, the team at ICMR. But the second one is uh, uh, very critical. A, to raise awareness and B, connect it. How do we build capacity for understanding the nuances of AI, the tools of AI, the approach to research in AI, deciding which tool to use for care, which tool to use for public health. I remember in the late 80s, there was a, a very successful program eventually run by the Rockefeller Foundation USAID for clinical epidemiology. That time, Indian academia, we would do research, but our research was mostly on communicable diseases and you know, classically lab-based and so on. We did not have 
real capacity for mounting systematic research, which today uh, you know, is a mainstream research. The, the clinical trials, cohort studies, case control, this the whole jargon was very, very vague to most of us. And we were benefited the initiative that was taken by this organization called Inclin. And they had, I guess, hundreds of such workshops and built capacity in India, uh, systematically cluster randomized trial, community-based trial. The whole you know, notion of research methods was built step by step by that initiative. And many of us, including myself, are very direct beneficiaries of that initiative. The point I'm putting on the table today is we must raise awareness, demystify to the extent possible the use of AI, research tools in AI, analysis in AI, demonstrating how to, how to design studies around AI, how to analyze AI relate, related data, how to interpret AI related data, how to draw conclusions from AI related studies. That is a science by itself. It is not intuitively known to us. And I believe it is evolving in any case. It's changing in its own right. And we could co-learn, co-create the, the, the paradigm of AI research as required for biomedical scientists and eventually clinicians because they would be interpreting uh, published data to, to embrace for practice. So I want us to, to raise awareness about the necessity to make advances in AI across this nation, reaching out to to medical faculties, to the profession, and reaching out to partners such as engineers and genomics fraternity and basic science fraternity, perhaps doing it together, reaching out to Ayurveda fraternity, dealing with research and so on. So how do we create an environment where it becomes a familiar notion? That is a very, very first step. And then it has many facets, but I would like to emphasize the facet that we create a research capacity in AI, in, in health, for health. We're sitting in DHR today. Uh, how do we enable our, you know, the new AIMSs and institutions of national importance as a start, let's say. Uh, so we need to create this movement where it becomes familiar to us to use data in an ethical way, in a systematic way, in a truthful way and to be able to interpret, which itself is a problem. So these are the two imperatives which I lay down for your kind consideration, dear colleagues uh, at, at CMR in particular. As you may be aware, toward the end, let me say that in the 2018 budget speech, the Honorable fin Finance Minister had tasked the Niti Ayo, my organization in the government, which is a, which is a think tank, national think tank on policy, that will develop a strategy, AI strategy for the country. And this document is in the public domain for almost a year, and it is called AI for All. That I should test AI. It talks about centers of research excellence to be established. It talks about a cloud-based resource uh, uh, called Aravat, which is basically a capacity resource and also highlights how individual research ideas will be taken forward. I am sure since this document much, you know, hell of a lot of more, you know, uh, water has flown down our great rivers many other things have happened. But remember that there is a thought process that has gone behind it and have a look at it and how to align our efforts to that strategy and how to use the elements of that strategy to advance it and also how to inform us the next version of such a strategy and therefore urge you to kindly keep in mind. <laughs> there is also, as you know, as many of you would know, that there is a national digital health blueprint. It was in the public domain very recently, which looks at the use of uh, uh, digital systems for advancing health, again, comprehensively as electronic health records, uh, preventive approaches, uh, entitlements, uh, purchasing services, and so on, the holistic digital health paradigm. And now it has been finalized, and a couple of days ago, only last week, it has been put in the public domain. I urge you to have a look at this, because that's one framework 
or frame through which a uh, lot of our AI related work would be aligned, will be built on, will be utilized as well. So this is National Digital Health Blueprint to translate into a National Digital Health Mission. And I think that road, that journey is now uh, uh, clear interministerially and I like us to, to, to understand the, 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 the underpinnings uh, of that. I would in the end congratulate uh, ICMR, Dr. Bhargav, the entire team at ICMR, uh, partners, WHO, partners, uh, Department of Telecom, and all of you for, uh, for being a part of this very important symposium, very timely, and I see a great gathering here, and I'm sure we will work systematically uh, this should lead to sp specific recommendations and please let us know what we can do at Niti Aayog in our own uh, strategic role, so to say. Uh, we'll be very happy. Uh, the role that we are uh, endowed with is connection role, interministerial, interdisciplinary connection role. And also because we wrote the AI for all strategy, we have a little more special role to be an enabler for unfolding this, uh, this great science and great technology. And like Mr. Sinaji said, that we mind, be mindful that the, we keep the genie in the bottle, or at least make sure the genie can go back into the bottle if need be. And uh, this tiger should be caged. Instead of climbing the tree, I hope the third person and all of them can stay out and the tiger can be in the cage. Indeed, that is a metaphor for saying that there are aspects in AI which are truly of concern, and genuine concern in an unsettled world with all kinds of people and uh, things that could go beyond human intelligence. So that concern, I agree. I would continue, i like us to continue to reflect upon how the HR uh, issues will emanate, labor workforce changes and shifts could potentially happen. Be mindful of that, keep informing. As of now, it looks very rosy to me for this, uh, this, uh, the health sector. Uh, because as you correctly said, there are not enough doctors, there are not enough pathologists, we could do something much more, much more accurate, and there's so much to be done by way of precision, so much to be done with speed. So right now we love AI because it will make us do that. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, should be, uh, we should be keeping track uh, as to how it will impact our uh, labor markets and so on, but it's okay, we have to live with it. The humanity has lived with these changes uh, many a time. And uh, as I said in the end, let me once again say that there is a strong resolve on the part of the government to, to advance AI and to be leader in AI in the world. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for those encouraging words, that great vision and showing us the way forward. We assure you, sir, that we'll take care of all the points highlighted by you. May I now invite uh, Mr. Manish Sinha, Director General, National Institute of Communication Finance, for her delivering vote of thanks. Respected Shri K. Paul, member of the IO. <coughs> Respected Member Finance, Digital Communication Commission, Respected G.S. Tuteja, Additional DG ICMR, Dr. Chandrasekhar, uh, Respected Sri, uh, Professor Thomas Wagner, and Rajiv Roy. Uh, and ICF became a partner of ICMR to take up this work to host the symposium as well as the focus group meeting that we are going to have over the next three days. Uh, for, in some ways, it was the first experience that we were having. And I'm really thankful that, and in fact, I find it very overwhelming the amount of wisdom that has been packed in the last one hour that we had from all the speakers on the dais. I would like to thank all the ITU WHO participants who have uh, traveled from various parts of the world to join this uh, exercise. Uh, I'm really glad that you are all here and we'll all be learning from your experience and your views that you express today and over the next three days. 
I would also like to thank all the participants from here, from the TEC, from DOT, who have uh, come here and are probably going to enrich the discussions that take place here. The first thing in the thanks, I would like to thank Professor Thomas for accepting our proposal to be a host for such an important international consultation on AI for health. Both ICMR and and ICF in a bigger way will gain from the participation that you have brought to our institutes. I'd like to thank Professor G.S. G.S. Tuteja and also somebody who's not, who could not be here today, Professor Balram, Dr. Balram Bhargav. Uh, I remember coming to him with a very nascent idea that could we do this? And I think it took us just maybe 10 or 15 minutes to convince a man of, uh, to, to, he accepted it readily and he said, let's go ahead and learn from whatever is happening in this particular focus group. So I'm really thankful to him, though he's not here. I, I hope Dr. Tudeja will convey our real special thanks to him. Uh, we also need to thank Professor Vico, VK Paul from the Niti IO. Uh, it's the leading organization so far as government is concerned for for uh, AI, and he mentioned that the national strategy, which has been in consultation for almost a year, it's a paper that we at NICF sir, are looking at and have been studying to see what is the route that you are designing for uh, bringing, making uh, AI more accessible and also looking at more affordable solutions that come from these uh, endeavors that we are going to make in, in the field of AI. Uh, there is a need to build the ecosystem around the AI, uh, around the AI and ensure that it comes into commercial use. One of them is what DOT has been trying over the years and what Sir P.K. Sinha was mentioning is the 5G infrastructure that we are building. And we also hope that whatever is developing on the edge of the 5G uh, grows in a manner that makes the 5G infrastructure uh, more usable and you know more sustainable. And AI would play a significant role in it. And in DOT, we'll have to ensure a fair and transparent regulation of the network while ensuring that continuous development of networks also takes place, which can support the development of, uh, of these uh, special usages that are developing around it. Uh, then I, at the end, I would like to thank the ICMR team. Uh, much of it is uh, led by Dr. Chandrasekhar and Rajiv Roy, who are all here, and they have been uh, partnering with us for the last uh, maybe one and a half months or so, trying to prepare for this program. Uh, there's a uh, set of young boys and girls, uh, Sonal, Iria, Gautam, Neha, and Deepak from ICMR, who are actually responsible for this comfortable day that we are going to have here today. And I also welcome you on behalf of NICF. Uh, next three days, we are going to host you it's a little away in Ghatodni, but uh, I'm sure you'll have a very comfortable time. Thank you for coming here and participating, and thank you to all the gentlemen on the dais.